welcome back. So, today, doing a little bit different episode. Not going to be looking at stamps, believe it or not. What we will be talking about is stamp collecting for dummies. My grandparents bought this for me when I was a kid, when I expressed an interest in stamp collecting. Um, say like 10 or 12 or something like that. And they actually took me to the bookstore and bought me this book. And uh, so I've been reading this in my free time. I'm mm, a little less than halfway through. And I've highlighted things that I thought are solid facts, important tips. Um, I've highlighted some things that I didn't know. I did learn a few things so far by reading this. And... Um, I figured that I would share them with you guys, so uh, yeah, this episode will be called Stamp Collecting for Dummies, and I'm just going to share the tips that I highlighted in the book. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you already knew plenty of the tips that I'm about to say, but there may be new viewers, new stamp collectors that are unaware of these pieces of information, and I would believe so because I get comments pretty often uh, from people that are just getting into the hobby that appreciate my channel and say they like my content and that they learn a lot of things and it's really nice to hear. I'm glad that I can be of uh, any kind of help to anybody. And so um, there may be some tips for you more seasoned collectors that you didn't know, but I wouldn't count on it so much. This is a pretty starting from nowhere kind of book. I mean, it's stamp collecting for dummies, right? Um, so, anyways, let's jump into it. I'm going to start reading my tips that I thought were worth sharing from the progress that I've made in this book so far. Okay, so this is from part one, Getting the Fundamentals Licked. Now, I actually only had highlighted a small portion of this paragraph, but I'm going to read this whole paragraph I decided. So, let me start. For more than the first half century of postage stamps, first issued in 1840, until about the end of the 19th century, commemoratives did not exist. Stamps at that time generally showed a portrait of the monarch, ruler, president, or whoever was leading the country at the time, the same portrait was used for a lengthy set of stamps, each with a different denomination. The same portrait may have been used for more than one set over a period of years or even decades. So, what, that, what they're talking about is, way back at the beginning, they used definitives, which pretty much showed a picture of the president's head, or a portrait. Okay? And they would use that stamp over and over, and they'd use different colors and different denominations on the stamp. If you don't know, denomination is the value, like one cent, two cent, five cent, so on. So stamps were kind of boring, at least as far as the image goes, on earlier issues. Starting from the beginning, they didn't have commemoratives. So, um, the stamp designs were rather drab, a single color, although many showed exquisite engraving skills, that's very true. Commemoratives generally are of a more interesting design and honor a person other than the heads of government or state, a place, a thing, or event. Commemoratives generally are on sale for a more limited time and therefore are produced in lesser quantities than regular definitive stamps. Now, I didn't know that. That's why I highlighted this. Definitives are often less colorful. That's true. It says, although that is changing. <laughs> Produced in far greater quantity and on sale for a much longer period of time than commemoratives. So that was my first piece of information. Yeah, I had no idea that uh, commemoratives were available for a shorter amount of time. Never thought about that, ever. And um, I never thought that they had lesser quantities than definitives. I never thought about that. So I found that interesting. That was news to me. 
All right, now this is something I'm sure many of you know. Uh, this little section is called Rebel Without a Stamp. It says, only once in history, at the beginning of the Civil War, to prevent U.S. stamps from being used in the Confederacy, were U.S. stamps demonetized, which means that they were no longer valid for postal use. They had no monetary value. That is, that postal authorities in Washington, D.C., at the beginning of the war, proclaimed that stamps issued before 1861 were not valid for postage. All U.S. postage stamps issued from 1861 through the present may be used on mail. How cool is that? So, you can today put any stamp issued in U.S. postal history on your letter to mail it as long as it was from 1861 onward to the present day. Now, of course, you never see that anymore. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a stamp from 1861 put on a recent letter, and that is most likely because, uh, for one thing, they're rarer, and uh, so people don't generally use them. Another thing is, Back in 1861, the cost to mail a letter was so much lower that they have way smaller values on the stamps themselves. You can't mail a stamp today with a one cent stamp, or a letter with a one cent stamp, or a five cent stamp, even ten cents, right? What is, it, what is it now? Sixty something cents for one single first class letter, right? So, what you would have to do is if you had a one or a five cent stamp, you'd stick that on your envelope, and then you'd have to use other stamps to make up the difference in the postal cost uh, if you wanted to mail it today. Now, I actually love, I don't know how many of you do this, but I love using older stamps on mail and older envelopes as well. As a matter of fact, just recently I sent my grandma a letter uh, that was a one of those stamped envelopes that had a pre-printed pre -printed, um, stamp on it and then um, I had to add additional stick-on adhesives to it to make up the letter rate. And uh, so I used a envelope from like 1958 or something like that to mail her a letter. And I just think that that's awesome. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I have a big tub of envelopes that are all kinds of different stamped envelopes and wrappers from a pretty wide range of time uh, from the U.S., so every now and then I like to pull one out and just use them. And I love the idea of using older stamps, older letters um, today in the mail. I just think that that's awesome. So um, anyways, that's something I do. And uh, I'm sure many of you knew that, that they demonetized the stamps before 1861 because of the Civil War. But I thought that was a great piece of information. I liked that piece of information and I wanted people to know that, especially if they're new to stamp collecting, that, that happened in U.S. postal history. Okay, so this next tip is about the very first postage stamp. We're all familiar. It's called the Penny Black. It was released in 1840 by Great Britain. Now, something that I didn't know, uh, that I've never really thought about, let's say, that stamp did not include the name of its issuing country, nor have any Great Britain postage stamps since. Okay. The world's first postage stamp also produced stamp collecting's first oddity. The country, or they're the only country never to have printed its name on postage stamps. I didn't actually realize that. Um, when you look at a big mix of stamps, you'll find almost every country has its name on it, right? Sweden, Switzerland, you know, wherever the stamp is from, Belgium, it's got its name printed on there. There's almost always things that are on stamps. The country that issued it, the denomination, right? Those things are almost always on a stamp. Why? You need that information, right? For it to be valid for postage. Well, I never really thought about it, but yeah, the Penny Black, Besides the portrait of Queen Victoria, has no indicator of what country that the stamp is for. It doesn't say Great Britain on there. And 
all the way up to current Great Britain stamps, they don't say <laughs> Great Britain on the stamp or the UK or any of that from what I know. So I thought that that was very interesting. Um, I've never had that epiphany from looking at stamps on their own and going through enough Great Britain stamps. I never picked that out. They don't say that on the stamp. They'll have usually a little tiny portrait, a little itty bitty portrait of Queen Victoria up in the corner of the stamp and that's how you know where it's from. Every other country, hundreds of other countries, they print their name on the stamp. So I thought that was cool. Okay, the next thing is about perforations. So there's kind of three things that go along here with perforations. There's, you have identical perforations on the whole stamp all the way around, top, bottom, sides. Then you have parallel matching perforations, which means that the sides have the same perfs and the top and bottom have their own set of perfs which are identical. So that's parallel matching measurements is what they call that. All right. Now the third thing is compound perforations where they can have different perforations on any side of the stamp. So um, I'm gonna skip the them explaining how to identify all four sides. Well, if they're all identical, that's simple and easy enough, right? Now parallel matching measurements, I wanted to mention one thing about this. They say here, two measurements are noted. If the top and bottom are perf 11, and the left and right sides are perf 10 and a half, the stamp is said to be a perf 11 by 10 and a half. The horizontal measurements across the top and bottom are given first and then the vertical. So I wish that somebody had explained that to me when I first started out because I would get confused. I'd be looking in the catalog and it'd say a stamp is 9 by 10. Well, which is the 9? Is that the top, the side? Like, I would get confused. So I think that that's a great tip. When you look up stamps in a catalog, when you see them described for sale, um, you know, when you're measuring them to try and identify the stamp, when we describe perforation measurements, that is the order that it is done, is the horizontal, meaning the top or bottom perforations first, so 11, let's say, by the sides, left or right, second, let's say 10 and a half. And that would mean that I have an 11, top and bottom, by 10 and a half, vertical on the side. That is how you describe the perforations. So let's talk about compound perforations, which I don't come across a whole lot, but that's a thing that you need to know about. It says a shorthand method measures the horizontal row of perforations across the top of the stamp, followed by the vertical measurements along the right, then the bottom, then the vertical measurements on the left. So, if you have a stamp that supposedly has compound perforations, in my mind, what works for me is clockwise. You're going to start at 12 o'clock, you're going to work your way to 3, then 6, then 9, okay? So you're going to go around in a circle, and that is the method that you would use to identify the perfs on a compound perforated stamp. So yeah, it goes from top, right, bottom, left. Anyways, I thought that was a great tip. Uh, if any of you have ever struggled measuring compound perfs and it gets complicated because you'll look in the catalog and it'll say it's 11 by 10 and a half by nine by three or whatever. And you're like, what the heck, there's four numbers. Which one is which side of the stamp? That is how you would tell. So next, there's a blab, uh, a blab. There's a paragraph here uh, that uh, I don't even remember what it's about, but I highlighted it, so let me read it to you. Only in extremely rare cases do all four sides have a different number of perforations. Even if two sides are the same and two others are different, the items would be considered, say, perf 12 by 11 by 12 by 10 and a half. Beginning with the measurement across the top of the stamp, then proceeding clockwise. Interesting, it does say clockwise. So basically they're saying it's extremely rare that you will come across compound perforations. Okay, and they're saying 
even if you have compound perforations, it's extremely likely that two of the sides will still have the same perf. <laughs> so you could have a 12 by 11 by 12 by 10 and a half. So that stamp actually had three different perforations. Two of them happen to be the same. Okay, so yeah, that, that explains, I mean, I almost never come across compound perforated stamps. Uh, in the past when I have, I've always been a little bamboozled, like, wow, really, what? You're telling me it has a whole bunch of different perfs? Well, anyway, that would be the method of how to check it, start at the top at 12 o'clock, and go clockwise when you're measuring those perfs. Okay, this next tip is about self-adhesive stamps. You guys may already be aware, I'm sure you are, most of you, that you have self-adhesives, and then you have water-based adhesive stamps, right? The lick and stick is the old style. You peel it off the page, or you, you pull it apart from its other stamps, you lick it and you stick it. Well, self-adhesives are the more modern stamps, where you just peel them off, they already have the adhesive ready to go, and you just stick it on your envelope. Real simple, right? Now this says, with the popular growth of self-adhesive stamps have come a new form of stamp separation, which is called die cut. And that's what we're talking about is the difference where the old stamp sheets, they had adhesive, but it wasn't activated. You have to activate it somehow with a lick or some water. It needs some kind of moisture to activate the adhesive. Well, self-adhesives are already adhesive all by themselves. They're ready to go. You don't have to do anything. And instead of like water-based stamps where you pull the stamps apart, which rips the perforations apart, self-adhesives are die cut, okay? You don't have to tear them apart from each other. It says, self-adhesive stamps are produced in two principal layers. The stamp with a sticky adhesive and its backing paper. Following the printing process for a self-adhesive stamp, a steel die is pressed to a predetermined depth on the sheet that is just deep enough to cut through the stamp and not deep enough to cut through the backing paper. Many collectors save them with the protective backing paper still attached. Anyway, so yeah, um, they press onto the newly printed sheet of stamps and they press it just enough that it, perf that it cuts through the stamp but not the backing paper that the self-adhesive stamp is stuck to. And that is the die cut. They call it like a serpentine cut and uh, most newer stamps, most recent modern stamps are self-adhesive and they have the die cut um, and you can tell a difference uh, for one thing when you're looking at a stamp you're asking yourself well is it self-adhesive or is it water-based adhesive from the past well if it's a used stamp take a look at the perforations for one thing on the older stamp since you had to pull them apart every perf would kind of be frayed, okay? Because you pulled those paper pieces apart, little fibers uh, on each little perforation kind of frays a little. And compared to a self-adhesive, which would have like smooth perforations, which are a little bit more rounded and serpentine in pattern. Um, so you can actually visually tell, at least in my opinion, on a lot of stamps, by the cut of the perforations, whether or not it is a self-adhesive or a water-based, water-activated adhesive. Okay, so um, I thought that was a great tip. Um, and anyways, let's move on to the next thing here, which says, in commercial printing, this can be done to produce very decorative results. In the case of self-adhesive stamps, die cutting permits a printing image that is much larger than a single stamp without having the design disrupted by pesky perforations and while still permitting ease of stamp removal from the protective backing. So basically they not having punched out whole perforations on the stamp allows them to print a larger image. I never thought about that. So I thought that was an interesting tip. 
Um, and um, <clears throat> yes, I would say that having serpentine or die cut perforations would make it easier to not disrupt the design that's printed onto the stamp. So I'd never thought about that and I thought that was an interesting tip. Anyways, let's move on to the next. Okay, so this next part talks about grading and condition. Now, uh, I also wish somebody had explained this to me um, when I first started out because I had no idea about this and I had to figure it out over time. Um, when I started selling stamps, I ended up learning this stuff, but let's talk about first grade, okay? When you're talking about the grade of a stamp, we're saying the centering of a stamp's design on the actual piece of paper that is considered the stamp. So exactly how well centered on the piece of paper that is the stamp is the image design. So lots of you know, this just rings in my head, margins, margins. People love even margins on stamps. That is a big part of how valuable a stamp can be. If you've seen older stamps, um, they weren't perfect. They sometimes were to the left or the bottom or the right or the top. The actual image printed on the stamp wasn't perfectly centered. So that is one of the considerations when you're evaluating the value of a stamp is what is the grade, or in other words, how well centered is the printed image on the stamp or the engraving. So anyways, next after that is condition, okay? It says an array of situations that degrade stamp value. For more information, see other stuff. Okay, let's we'll see another chapter. <laughs> All right, well, that, I don't know why I highlighted that. Um, I mean, yeah, the condition. Is it ripped? Is it stained? Is it yellowed? Is it torn? I mean, bent, creased. Um, so maybe, mm, I don't know if I highlighted it in chapter six, but yeah, so grade is the centering and then condition is pretty, pretty self-explanatory to be honest. But next, I have a, highlighted a paragraph here, so let me read this. Grade is a sliding scale that affects value. And condition is an all or nothing situation that affects value. All the aspects of condition must be positive or a stamp is severely devalued, devalued. Grade is essentially keyed to the centering of the design on the stamp. Okay, and that's what we were saying. Catalog value is keyed to a specific grade, which is currently very fine. And market value will increase or decrease based on the stamping of a greater or lesser grade than the pricing standard. That is so true, and I've had lots of people spout that off at me when I you know, show my old albums, my old U.S. albums, uh, my Mystic albums, let's say. I wrote the catalog values beneath each stamp in those albums. And I would have people chime in and say, that stamp isn't worth $50 like you wrote because the grade isn't that, that good. It's like, okay, they're 100% correct. Um, when I made those albums, and when I still make things today, I will put that as a general indicator of the stamp's value. And me having this knowledge, when I look at my stamp album and I see that I wrote cat value of $50, I know already that that is for the value of the stamp if it is very fine condition and grade, right? That is how it's done in the catalog. So when I look at the actual stamp, if I see that it's off center, then I know that in reality, I can devalue that stamp based on that kind of benchmark, 
of the catalog value. That's how it works for me. So I, I wrote $50 cat beneath the stamp, but I'm not saying that it's actually worth $50. I'm saying in the catalog, they're saying this stamp in very fine condition and grade would have this value attached to it. Also, by the way, those values are for dealers, basically, those catalog values. Um, so, um, yeah, anyways, I think that that's a great piece of information uh, for anyone who doesn't know that, any new collectors. Uh, when you go look up your stamp in the catalog and you've verified the perfs or the watermark and you've determined which stamp you have, you say, oh, cool, it's number 116. And it says in in mint condition it's worth a hundred dollars. You go, oh my gosh, I have a hundred dollar stamp. Well, even if your stamp is in mint condition, what's the grade? How well centered is it? And this goes really deep too. Um, you know, for each different issue, uh, you can have. Like some stamps that are known to be off center. So even if the image design is not perfectly centered, it may actually be pretty good centering for that issue and be considered very fine. Just because it isn't perfectly centered, the image on the stamp, um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that it isn't very fine grading. So it gets very complicated and it can be a real pain in the butt. And there are dealers out there I know and old relic stamp collectors that are 90 years old, 80 years old, whatever, that are aware of the fact that different issues of stamps throughout time have different centering, you know, especially like flat plate printed stamps. They would actually smack a plate down and print the image design like that. They would be off center, and they were known to be off center. And you'd be really hard pressed to ever find certain issues of stamps that are perfectly centered. It'd be like an incredible rarity. Um, so just to talk about that, yeah, um, this is something that you should be considering if you're actually going to get into grading and valuing stamps. Yeah, you've got to know that um, it's complicated and but the bottom line is basically the more well centered the image design the better and that's because people want for one thing to have the entire image design on the stamp sometimes they're so far off center some of the design is missing like the bottom corner of the the guy's portrait you can't even see it, it it's it they didn't even get it well enough centered on the stamp excuse me, for you to see the whole image design clearly. And that's why people love margins that are even and full on all four sides of the stamps. That's a, an easy way to tell how well centered it is. So anyways, let's move on. Okay, so this next one is still about grading. It says, the written definition for the very fine grade level is stamps may be slightly off center on one side but the design will be well clear of the edge the stamp will present a nice balanced appearance imperforant stamps will have three normal sized margins interesting so the stamp catalog values don't mean that it's perfectly centered even in the condition of very fine grade, sorry, not the condition, even in the grade of very fine, it's not perfect, right? You can get better than very fine when you're talking about grading stamps. You can get superb, which is like amazing. Um, you know, those gems that are just like printed perfectly, perfectly centered, right? With even margins on all four sides. So anyways, I just wanted to share that one because I think that is a nice clarification. That's the actual written definition that the stamps may be slightly off center on one side, but the design will be well clear of the edge and they will present a nice balanced appearance. Okie dokie. Next tip. 
So, this says, taking note of the marketplace, where catalog value represents the theoretical approach to the worth of an item based on research and calculations, market value is the reality of the situation. Market value is the amount that you pay a dealer for a stamp, set, lot, collection, or whatever. So yeah, the catalog value is, like they say, a theoretical approach. In theory, right? If the stamp has very fine grading or centering and is in very fine condition, theoretically, it's worth this much. That's how catalog values work. And then, yeah, so the market value, totally different. It's what is the reality of what of the situation of what you're actually going to pay a dealer for a stamp so they're two different things i thought that that was a good uh a good thing to to take note of you know i i probably should have read this book when i started stamp collecting seriously a few years ago because it probably would have helped me to clarify a few things um, that I just had to figure out by trial and error. And um, so, yeah, you know, that the short summation of that is, yeah, I mean, your catalog value is more than likely not the actual real world value of the stamp where you just sell it or buy it. That's important. It's very, very true. Um, and yeah, I don't have it happen so much, but when I first started out, yeah, people were just reaming me about um, that my stamps aren't really worth that much, aren't worth that much, and that's fine. You know, I just, like I said, I like to put the cat value on there as a general figure for me to base what I really think it's worth off of, okay? If I say it's worth $50 cat, then I'm going to look at it and say, well, it has a bend, though, it has a crease, or it has a pulled perf on the corner, or it's off center, or and then it's like, okay, well that takes our fifty dollars and drops it down to twenty, or you know, like I just know that it devalues it any issues that I may find based on that kind of number figure. Um, that works for me. You guys can do whatever you want. Um, a lot of people don't even care about the value of the stamps. The reality is most stamps aren't worth much, and the odds of you actually finding a valuable or um, expensive stamp in random sorting of accumulations is pretty slim i have got to say but it definitely happens and that's part of the fun of this for me for sure when i sort and organize collections and i go through them it is like a treasure hunt it is because you really don't ever know for sure you might just find a little gem in the pile of madness that's fun i love that um so Anyway, that's um, part of the allure of stamp collecting for me is the treasure hunt. And it's not that it's all about finding stamps that are worth money and making me rich. No. I mean, that's nice. I love that. But no, it's not what it's all about. It's just a part of it. And why not enjoy that aspect of it? Um, you know, just have realistic expectations that you're more than likely not going to find any stamps worth jack shh. You know what I'm saying? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it, like A lot of people say, if you're in, in this hobby to get rich, you're in the wrong hobby. Okay? So, um, it says here, unlike catalog value, which is respected wherever the specific catalog is used, market value may be more localized. For example, if you are at a local stamp show and one of the six dealers there has an item that you desire, what you pay for the item is the market value. Okay. So yeah, just um, yeah, the 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 stamp may have a cat value of a hundred. Then you go to an actual stamp show and the real world market value of it is sixty dollars or forty dollars. That's what you actually pay a dealer. So. Just a thought. Okay, this next section in the book is knowing what your collection is worth. Now, I wanted to talk about replacement cost. Okay, this says calculate the replacement cost. 
simply, replacement cost is what you would have to spend to replace the material in your collection in one effort. Replacement cost is what at least one major stamp insurance provider requires of its customers. So, at the same time, replacement cost requires you to understand your collection to the point of knowing how to factor grade and condition into the value of individual items. If you are one who will only purchase the best available examples of a stamp, your replacement value will be more than one who accepts the Scott Standard Postage Stamp Catalog Standard of very fine grade. So in other words, if you only collected the best examples, like perfect centering, perfect condition, everything's perfect, the perfs, the color, um, like the grade and the condition, right? And we said grade was a sliding scale, okay? So it's perfectly centered, superb centering. And condition is an array of different factors, right? Like we were discussing. Is it bent, creased, is it ripped, is it yellowed, any of that, right? Any kind of damage whatsoever, any kind of flaws, anything that would make it not post office fresh, like it was just off the printing press, right? That kind of stuff is where that guy only collects the best examples, period. So his replacement cost for his collection, if you were to tally up all of the different stamps that he owns in his collection using the Scott Standard Postage Catalog, it would actually be more in reality than what the catalog says it's worth because the catalog is for things in very fine condition, but his were superb. So, anyways... Next, calculate the resale value. Resale value is the amount you accept when selling your collection to a dealer. How a dealer reaches that amount can often be attributed to voodoo or something like it, which is why you should get offers from at least two dealers. This is very true from what I've heard. I have never sold anything to a dealer but um, it would be, in my mind, the same as, uh, you know, if you had an antique uh, table lamp and you knew that it was extremely rare and there was only 100 of them made in the world and you go and get a price from one, one dealer and then you say, well, let me go and get a price from another dealer too and compare the two and just make sure that I'm not getting ripped off. Um <clears throat> I think that that's well put that how the dealer reaches the amount that they offer you can be attributed to voodoo. Yeah, I mean, some of it's going to come down to simply what that person thinks. And this actually jogs my mind a little where I think about how um, I've read that, you know, if you were going to go sell your stamp collection to somebody, let's say you had a Germany collection, um you wouldn't want to sell your Germany collection to somebody who, uh, a dealer, or I guess an individual, who uh, is predominantly into, you know, uh, Spanish stamps, like from Spain. You're probably going to get more money if you sold your German collection to a German stamp dealer than a Spain stamp dealer. Yeah, really... They're saying they're not all created equal, okay? So if you do inherit a collection, let's say, you're going to want to get multiple opinions on the value of the collection before you pull the trigger and sell it to somebody because you never know. One dealer may offer you a significant amount more than the other dealer. And why? Because the stamps are worth more to them. You know, that's why you, it's it's what they collect, you know, a, a German, a Germany dealer is simply going to have more affinity and interest in German stamps than some other dealer that doesn't specialize in Germany. And therefore, it's worth more to him. Right? Also, 
a stamp dealer must buy and sell stamps to stay in business. Yeah. Or, to be more positive, how well a dealer buys and sells stamps directly affects the success of his business. A generalized belief is that the price a dealer offers you for material relates to how quickly the dealer believes he will be able to sell the same material. Although there may be some truth to that belief, it is a bit simplistic. I mean, that's, I think that that's a good, um, a good piece of information, right? They're buying these stamps to sell the stamps. That's a dealer for you, right? That's what they do. If a dealer doesn't think that he's going to be able to sell your stamps or offload all that stuff and material that you've you've given him within a reasonable amount of time, he's probably going to pay you less for it. He's going to say, "Okay, I mean, I'll sure I'll buy your collection, your accumulation, but odds are I'm going to have to hold on to it for for a year until I can actually find somebody to sell it to." Or somebody says, "Oh my gosh, your collection is coveted material," and popular issues that I'll probably be able to get rid of really fast so I'm going to give you a fair good a good price on it because I know I'm going to be able to turn around and flip this stuff and sell it really fast right it's a good point it says here certainly dealers need to purchase materials so there is inventory to sell some dealers have customers with standing want lists which is a list of material they seek right stamps that they're after when they come across wanted items dealers are quick to buy i think that's awesome information okay let's continue on so another more specific reason to make a purchase is to restock the stamps the dealer generally sells over time also the dealer may have dealer friends who are looking for certain types of material the dealer it's the dealer is purchasing for someone else's inventory. That could be. No matter what the specific reason is, it is far from unusual for dealers to purchase only the items that they require. And a purchase includes plenty of lower value items. I, I never thought about that. Yeah, I mean, sure, a dealer could easily purchase some stuff to sell to another dealer because they know they're after it. Or something that is on a want list that one of their customers said, Hey, when you ever, you know, if you ever come across this number 49 from Belgium, make sure that you let me know, boom, he's going to buy it and sell it. So when a dealer looks at what you are offering, particularly when you are offering a collection, a single album, or more than just a few stamps, the price the dealer quotes you is pretty much based on the key items. Okay. Thus, if you have an album of U.S. stamps, the dealer pages through the album and spots specific items. If the items that the dealer is seeking are present, the dealer notes the condition and begins to tally. The lower value material is essentially disregarded and just goes along for the ride. <coughs> Excuse me. Dealers strip the material they really want from the rest of what they just purchased when they arrive back home. Then the remainder may be resold to another dealer or collector. Or perhaps just store it away. Over time, the dealer amasses quite a bit of low value material. The dealer sells the low value material to a wholesaler. Or, the dealer makes up his own packets for sale. This is how a dealer can offer 5,000 different stamps for 80 bucks and not lose any money. Very interesting to me. Uh, you know, this reminds me of my grab bags. I mean, yeah, it ends up, the grab bags, uh, you know, I love the mix of all the different stamps from all across the world and it kind of makes me feel a little bit like a stamp dealer the way that I did it was yeah I accumulated I bought a bunch of collections accumulated a bunch of lower value stamps created a mixture packaged it and sold it that's exactly what I did I basically followed you know the ways of a stamp dealer by doing that and 
There's nothing wrong with that at all. This is, what do you do with your accumulated lower value stamps? You know? Um, so, I find this stuff very interesting. They called this a tip, this uh, the long blabbing section here. Um, but... This reminds me of, I'm pretty sure that I had read this before I valued my first collection. I did a series, if you didn't know, um, on my channel where I uh, attempted to value this lady's collection. And it was my first try ever. And um, I, I, I think that this was in the back of my mind, this section in this book. Because um, that's the basic idea. She, she gave me a huge box of stamps and it was like well i'm not gonna literally tally every single stamp i mean there's thousands and thousands of stamps i went and searched through them all and tallied up only the items that i thought were better items or higher value stamps and the rest of it i decided to pay her based on weight like ten dollars per pound like that kind of idea so Anyways, um, that is going to be, I think, the reality if you ever do go to sell your collection. I'm sure that a dealer is going to thumb through your album pages and really only care about specific items, specific stamps. The rest of it is just mm, fluff. It's not important to him. And he's not going to take major note of every single stamp that you have, okay? So anyways, moving on. So this is as far as I've gotten. This is the final thing. And this involves soaking self-adhesive stamps off of envelopes or paper pieces. So this says, current U.S. self-adhesive stamps have an extra layer of paper between the adhesive and the paper on which the stamp is printed. So, you can soak the stamp off from the paper in a manner similar to soaking the paper off from stamps that are not self-adhesive, so traditional gums. So, <clears throat> I'd never heard of that. And uh, so this is saying that between the actual adhesive on the back of the stamp and the paper that the printed image is on, there's another layer in between those two, <laughs> which enables you to soak your self-adhesive stamp off of the envelope. <clears throat> now it says that with current US self-adhesive stamps. I had never heard that before, so I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, uh, I use heptane to separate self-adhesive stamps, um, which is a caustic chemical, and uh, some people don't like that. Uh, but apparently, you can actually still just soak some self-adhesives off, period. Now, uh, so that was the final tip. Now, I want to mention that this book uh, is actually from 2001, okay? So I don't know if anything has really changed. There may be some updates to certain pieces of information in this. But, uh, yeah, overall, uh, yeah, 2001 copyright on this book. So it's been 22 years since this was printed, since I picked this up. So, some things may have changed, um, but um, <clears throat> the past doesn't change. So, all of the information, for the most part, is valid to me. And um, I, do, I do really enjoy this book. Uh, I mean, there is an awful lot of information that I left out, of course, in this video. Um, those were things that just piqued my interest, that I didn't know or I thought were worth sharing in case somebody out there didn't know them. And uh, there's a lot more to learn in this book without question. So um, I'm going to keep on reading it, and then as time passes, it'll sure be a while. It took me a while to get to this point. I'm very casually reading this book. I'll make another video, and we'll talk about any more tips or cool information that I thought was worth sharing in the future. So... I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I know that this is totally different from my normal video. I didn't actually even show a single stamp. But I've been planning on making this video for a while. And um, so I hope that some of this information was helpful to somebody out there. 
if you enjoyed this video, drop a like, uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of my content. Um, I appreciate you guys, and I will be back later on with the next video where I just about guarantee we're actually going to be looking at some stamps. <laughs> All right, see you later, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>